So for those of you who don't know Barbara Schulberg, and that would be extraordinarily unusual if, you've, if you're doing anything at all uh, in life sciences and paying attention to startups in, in Philadelphia and in the greater Philadelphia region, um, Barbara and I have a, a fairly significant history going all the way back to when she was first hired to start BioAdvance. Um, I'm happy to say that I was on the search committee that had the wisdom to recognize the value proposition that she was bringing to the, to the table. I'll still remember that interview. Everybody thought somebody else was going to get this job, and she blew people away in the interview. And it, it just became very obvious that she was, she was the right choice to take on what is essentially a startup for startups in a commonwealth that had never done anything even remotely like this. So, so Barbara has uh, not only a track record back in the days of Cephalon when she was the right-hand woman to the late, great Frank Baldino, but now has a, a, an amazing track record at BioAdvance, and she's gonna talk about some of those successes, but also to kind of give you a snapshot of the state of, uh, of circumstance in venture capital and in startups. Uh, she is a wealth of knowledge, she is a generous spirit, and I am so happy to, that she's part of the venture capital scene and early stage funding, uh, early stage company development. And, uh, and she, she's, just, she's just, just a gift of a human and a wonderful um, uh, advocate for startups in our region. Please join me in welcoming Barbara Schilberg. <laughs> Well, it's great to be here, and particularly, can you, everybody hear me? Okay. Um, and hello to people on other campuses. This is the first time I think I've spoken that it hasn't been a weather disaster, and I was reminding people at the table that April 13th last year, it snowed, so it could have definitely been another, we could have gone another direction today. So I'm delighted to be here in such beautiful, uh, sunny conditions. All right, where's the clicker? Oh, wait, here we go. Okay, I'm gonna th have three topics today, all of them related to capital, basically. I'm gonna give a little bit of background about BioAdvance because as I thought about it, and we do go back a ways, um, we've really evolved over time to accommodate changes in the capital market. So it's a way to sort of get you acclimated to the history of some of venture capital. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about what the s situation is today in the venture capital, both nationally and regionally. And then I'm going to talk about, there are some messages that I think we need to convey. Um, so I'll, somebody can keep an eye on time too, so in case I go over. So yes, way back in 2002, we were started by the community. It was academic institutions, it was industry people, and it was corporate citizens like uh, Greater Philadelphia First and, and people like that. I was thinking about this, Donna. I think you and Roseanne are the only two people that are still in the landscape from that era. So congratulations on being a survivor, which is no surprise. If you know Donna, you know that's not a surprise. Um, so thank you. <laughs> thank you for the kind words. So we got, we got started um, because everybody was worried about what we call the valley of death. If you've been starting a company or working in a small company, you know very well what the term valley of death means. But this is what the world looked like back in 2002 uh, when we got started. So the dotted line shows um, NIH funding, relatively speaking, on one of the axes. Then the bar chart shows what was going on in the early stage venture capital. And I'm gonna pause here because just in case you don't know what venture capital is, um, it's private money that takes risks, but in return it expects high rewards better than you can get if you just put your money in the stock market or the bond market or something. So the whole concept is it is risk capital. And this early stage risk capital was critical to the start of the biotech industry for one thing. It started actually in the tech industry and was the critical um, ingredient for getting the tech industry started even in the 80s and 70s. So in um, the, the tech bubble burst back in 1999, for those of you who remember 1999 or 2000, it was, it was ugly, it, the public markets shut down, and anytime the public markets sneeze, you know, the private markets get pneumonia, so they shut down too. So you can see what was going on, and we, it, the valley of death opened up, especially for early stage, and we were set up to sort of address that problem. So 
To me, phase one of BioAdvance was the first five years. We started our first investment in 2003, and, and um, in 2008, we all know what happened then. So those first five years, though, our job was to really step in and take um, technologies that had been in academic institutions and uh, maybe had finished some NIH grants, but they still hadn't answered the key question that you needed for industry or venture capital to be interested in. So our job was to step in at that point. We, we somewhat arbitrarily picked up the, on the number of 500,000. We thought that was a decent number. We had looked around and there were some groups that were doing very small investments. We thought in the life sciences they were too small. So we wanted to pick what we thought was a meaningful number. We had a very small footprint, five counties in and around Philadelphia. Um, and we had $20 million to put to work. So, the, and the whole idea was to, to answer a key question so that venture capital would come on board and would be there at the next stage. And we had VCs at our table. We got, had a lot of input and feedback, but they were the audience. And in, um, remarkably, some companies that we funded in those early days are still around. So Avid was acquired by Lilly. They were working on an Alzheimer's imaging agent. They're still at the Science Center. They're growing. I think they have hundreds of people there. So they are kind of the imaging group for Lilly. So that's a, a fabulous result for the region. And then some companies you may recognize, like InfraScan and Melior Discovery, have been around. I think we funded them both in 2005. So it's great to see companies still surviving and contributing to the local economy. But then, so things were rolling, rolling along. Oh, let's see, there we go. So you can see, this is a, just a chart of venture capital in Pennsylvania. And you can see what was going on. It starts in 2003. And if you get into the 2005, 6, 7, things are really starting to roll along. We're really bringing in a lot of capital. Things were happening. So the, the greenhouse program, which is what we are part of, was working. There were also four local venture funds that were funded by the tobacco settlement along with us in 2004, I think. And so you could really see things coming together. And then, of course, all good things come to an end, and we had the market crash in 2008. And that's where you see, um, you know, Pennsylvania was hit pretty hard. We, we really uh, lost a lot of the venture capital. It just froze. Once again, just like it did in the tech bubble, it froze and sort of was in paralysis somewhat. So then we looked at that and went, oh my God, we can no longer assume our companies are gonna go on and raise venture capital. We have to think about plan B and really move companies more towards other sources of money. And fortunately, people were trying to solve this crisis, but it wasn't just us. And so the NIH was introducing new programs for translational um, foundations had decided they were not going to fund just academic institutions, they would fund small companies. So there were a lot of resources coming uh, to fruition, and we thought, okay, so that's going to be our primary goal. So we did a couple things. We increased the amount of investments we'll make to, uh, to a million, because we figured out oh, we're going to have to support companies a little bit longer, and maybe with a little more money than we had before. Um, we added a group of investments called research tool companies, which is sort of the non-FDA regulated products. Uh, we thought that, oh, they would need less money, they could get to revenue, they don't have to go through the FDA. We were wrong, but we, you know, it was an experiment. So, um, but we did expand what we invested in for that purpose. And I think that at that point, though, um, we were in a declining get cash balance. We probably had more like 12 million to 15 million to invest over that time period. So we were hoping, our, we're an evergreen fund and that means we recycle our returns. We don't take them personally and we don't take, we don't give them away to other people. We keep it inside BioAdvance and we put it back to work on the street. So we were waiting for some returns to come in and, and uh, sort of looking at our cash balance going down. But also we knew we had to just keep investing more per company to, to keep things going. So fortunately, by 2013, one of our companies was acquired by J&J, &J, and it was a big number. It's still confidential today, but it, it gave us a huge return. Uh, so we started off in the beginning of 2014 with, um, together with our cash balances from before. So we started off with 50 million. So all of a sudden, we've really jumped in size. So a great problem to have. And now the question becomes, well, how do we deploy 50 million? We've been deploying 10, 12, 15 million before, so now all of a sudden we're at a different scale. So one of the things we did, um, we have expanded our geography a little bit. We go 
we are lazy, so we don't like planes and hotels, but we, the I-95 corridor works really well. So we get up to New York and go down to DC. Um, I have to admit though, 80% or maybe more, maybe 90% of our investments are still in the Philadelphia area, even though we theoretically look further afield. We have some in New York. Um, uh, we also increased our maximum investment to a million five, and then on a few occasions we've gone to our board and we've asked for more. And so we've gone up to two and a half million and we're starting to lay the groundwork to go even more because we think that's what you need to do around here. And I think the most important thing, and I'll talk about this again, um, is we started, you know, instead of coming in just by ourselves, which was our role, our mission was to come in first, come in alone, and hope that we could get to the, private, the rest of the private sector. Um, this, now we're really looking seriously at syndicating with other investors. We're still doing the coming in alone when it makes sense and we're still looking for opportunities where we can get a technology to alternative resources. But we're also looking to syndicate with other investors, preferably outside the region, because we really want to start bringing in more capital, because I'm going to tell you why we need to do that. All right. Um, these are some of our recent investments. They are really across, uh, they show the diversity. These are the ones since, I think, July. Um, we have an Uber for health systems founded by um, some students out of Penn when they were seniors, and now they've moved on. Um, Talox Medical is a, is a medical device uh, that came out of CHOP, a CHOP pediatric surgeon. Um, it just helps infants who have malformed little ears, and it helps um, resolve those when they're uh, newborns. Um, Obsidio is an anti-fibrotic um, uh, uh, biologics company. Palvella is a rapamycin for um, a very serious rare, rare disease in the derm space, Pachyonychia congenita, and IOBio is a cell therapy. So it really covers the waterfront. We're, we are eclectic, which keeps it interesting. Um, and where we are today, we've invested 40 million. We probably have 40 million more to go. So we don't expect to take 15 years to do that. The, we're deploying um, much more money per year than we have in the past. I think this is going to be our biggest investment year ever. I think we're probably going to be at six or seven million dollars committed um, to, to a lot of new companies. So it's all good. So let me turn now. Oh yeah, that's where we are. I keep forgetting to click. <laughs> it's like, I guess I'm, I should be paying attention to that. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what's going on in the national venture capital. And I know there are some people who may be, especially at other campuses, who may not be in the life sciences. So this is actually all sectors. This is relevant. It includes tech, energy, other fields. So the good news is the tech sector, I mean, the um, venture capital sector is doing great. A ton of money is being thrown at it. I think people are searching for high returns. Um, funds are getting bigger. Uh, if you look at the next slide, you'll see sort of the trend. This is all, all sectors, all stages, but it's very robust. Um, most of this money is actually not for healthcare, um, but um, so, it, so there's a lot going on in drones and alternative energy and things like that. But, I, but what's interesting though, and, and a little bit of a, a cautionary uh, flag, is that you'll see that the number of deals has actually decreased. Um, and that's true at most stages of, uh, across the board. And, but more money is being thrown at the companies that are getting money. So the lucky few are getting more money, um, which is good for them because it gives them a higher chance of success. But the money is not being spread around. It is actually being concentrated in a few companies. And in fact, um, yeah, this is, uh, in the life sciences, it, it represents only about 20% of all venture capital. So it seems low, but, uh, you know, it just tells you how much money is going on in the tech world, and um, particularly in California. So um, I think a couple things that are um, relevant, 17 billion was invested in about 1,100 deals in life sciences across um, all stages. Now, what was scary to me in this, in this data, and it's all, it's all out of pitch book, um, only 130 plus deals were first round deals in the pharma biotech space. And that just 
struck me as being, wait a minute, this is all this NIH money? Across the country, there are only 130 plus deals getting venture funding for the first time to get started. That was kind of a scary number to me. It, it sort of feels right because I think it is hard to get venture capital, but it was a shocking number. And med tech is even worse. Um, they only had, there were only 82 deals being done in the med tech space. And, if, and a, the actual dollars devoted to med tech, it was only like 278 million compared to, I think it was 2 billion that went into the pharma biotech. So way different scale of investment. And I think that is something you have to be aware of if you're, if you're developing a device or a diagnostic, I think that supply of money is going down. Pharma biotech, definitely going up. All right, so let's shift to what's going on here. So there are a lot of good things going on. And, if, and it, you know, the fact that this program even exists is an example of really good things happening. And I think um, the, you know, science for us is not a problem in this region. We have a ton of it. And more importantly, we have a lot of new programs and opportunities to sort of polish the technology. There's coaching, there's competitions that come with coaching. Um, and and it's, it's just a fascinating uh, diversity of, of um, what I call pre-seed or accelerator programs that's popping up. And I think possibly one of the most interesting things going on is that institutions are starting to invest in their own technology. So the most remarkable example, if you came to Jeff Morazzo's talk, I don't know if he mentioned, but CHOP put in tens of millions of dollars into Spark to get it going. It's like, uh. so other institutions, not, they're not going to do it on that scale, but people are saying, hmm, maybe, maybe we ought to start thinking about this and maybe we ought to go to our trustees and ask for permission. I think that'll really change the dynamic if, if more institutions start putting meaningful amounts of money into local, into their own technology. So, like, rock on. Let's, let's hope we can, We'll have to bring that up with uh, Dr. Clasco. Oh, he's for it. Oh, he's for it. Okay. Well, we'll help. We can help. So, um, but the other thing to know about this region um, is that we have two strong sources of technology. It's not just academic institutions, and it's not just uh, technologies that are funded by the NIH or NSF. There's a strong industry presence, and people coming out of industry have ideas, and the, and we funded some of them, and we've made a lot of money on some of them. So we actually we, we like. We're about 50-50, so we do 50% academic and 50% people who have their own ideas and they're just, just self-invented, for lack of a better word. Um, the other good news, I think, is that we have, there is no problem finding space, <laughs> at least I don't think, and if, if people have a hard time finding space, let me know, because I think it's in a head-spinning array of co-working spaces and labs and incubator spaces, and I can't keep track of it. I really tried for a while and I gave up. So um, space should not be an issue, and if it is, you'd need to talk to me, uh, because I think that would be, that would, that's not the reason not to start a company. Um, and then the other exciting thing, I think, going on is the rise of student entrepreneurs, and you can just feel it in the air. These are some of the companies that we've found, funded, that were founded by students, and it's just so much fun. You know, they need a little bit of guidance, but no lack of energy, passion, drive, enthusiasm, it's just very refreshing. And I think that is happening, it's almost contagious and it's the best kind of infection because student, it's like peer pressure to I wanna have a company, I wanna have a company. That's actually what happens in California in, in institutions, it's faculty members all wanna have companies and that's kind of the mentality that you really wanna see and I think we're starting to build it from the student base here and I hope it affects faculty members as well. Um, okay, so, but we, we have sort of a mixed bag on the capital side, and I think that's the area that I, is worth talking about a little bit more. Um, so the good news is we have a very robust seed investing space, and I'll show you data in a minute. The bad news is we are declining when it comes to the Series A financing. So here's, here's a look. This is the seed, oh, here's the seed capital. Um, wait. Uh, there it is, okay. Um, the seed capital, this is just over the last five years. You can see it's really taken a trajectory. A couple things, reasons for that. I think the Bens are very, there were a couple new programs. The Bens got some extra money. They're active across all sectors. This is all sectors, by the way. It's not just life sciences. Um, I think, uh, 
some angel groups had been in this investment where we made a lot of money, so did they. And they got a big influx of capital and they've been putting it to work since 2014. Um, and then we've been chugging along too with our own investments. So I think there are three big components of the seed space and in fact, Pennsylvania has 8% of the seed capital that's invested, which is pretty high um, for a single state. California puts us to shame, but it's still, it's really good. Um, however, there we go. I don't know what I have to point at, okay. Um, Series A deals are kind of erratic kind of all over the place, but it's not looking great from this database. Now, you ignore 2018 because, in, in both of these charts, because obviously it's only two months, two or three months old. Um, but the C, Series A deal, so Series A is really the first round of what venture capitalists usually come into. Seed tends to be from small groups like us, uh, and Series A is when the big guys come in. So we're, we seem to be on the wrong side of the slope when it comes to Series A. And I think that's a cause for concern. Uh, now this is again all sectors, but you see the same trend in life sciences as well. Um, and so by comparison, I said we had 8% of seed capital, so Pennsylvania only had 1.6% of Series A capital, so that's way too low. And in years past, we've had more like six, 7%, so we are losing traction on that side. So this is where we start to get worried, and we've been trying to dig into these the data a little bit, so this was a timely uh, lunch, because we're concerned about it. We see it in our own portfolio, and, and the fact of the matter is that a lot of these seed companies are not graduating to Series A. Um, and there are a couple reasons why that may be fine. Um, three of them are listed here, there may be others, but, but we think there are there's some things going on that we need to deal with. So one good reason would be that a company, especially if you're in the digital health space, uh, you know, maybe you can get to revenue and you know, bootstrap your way and not have to need much more money than a seed investment. Frankly, I haven't seen that yet, but that's theoretically possible. Um, the second possibility is very possible because we fund people so that they get alternative sources of capital. And, and if you get a lot of grants, it doesn't show up in these databases. And in fact, much to my frustration, we have a company called Venatorix that is in the infectious disease space. And they raised $3 million of friends and family, including us, back in the day, like seven or eight years ago. Then they went out and got $100 million of non-dilutive capital. And then just last year, they got $40 million of top tier of VCs came in in their series. Actually, technically it was a series B, I think. But it shows you that and none of that showed up in our data. So we have this robust company that's hiring all kinds of people. Nobody knows about it, and it's not recorded in any of the books anywhere. But in any event, so non-dilutive capital is fine. We're perfectly happy. We recognize it may not show up, and our numbers may not look as good. And some, some companies are in that situation where they are really just supporting themselves and growing. Integral Molecular is another example, longstanding example, where they've grown and are a very successful company. They've never taken a nickel of of private investor money. So, but the third category is what we're more concerned about and we see this in our own portfolio and there are just some companies that are stuck at the seed stage. So we've been trying to figure out what is going on. It, it feels like they don't have momentum. It feels like they're just not creating value. They're kind of surviving, but they're not thriving. And so two data points that I think have to, oh my goodness. Okay, here's the first data point that I think we have to be aware of. The, the size of financings in Pennsylvania is quite small. compared. We're in the bottom five states in terms of median financing. Um, and if you look at this chart, these are sort of our neighbors. Um, you can see the, the magnitude, even in New Jersey, you know, and particularly in New York uh, and then Massachusetts. But it's quite, it's three times to five times bigger than the financing we get, that our companies get here. And the problem, if you're only doing half a million dollars, this is a median, so some people are getting more and some people are getting less. But if you're only getting half a million dollars or so, it means you, you, you know, you, the next year you have to raise more money, so you're constantly in fundraising mode. It's hard to attract talent when, if you only have half a million dollars or a million dollars in the bank, you can't get the best salesperson if you're a digital health company. 
I mean, so it, and, and you lose momentum. So this undercapitalization is a problem, and I think we have to fix it. And then the second reality, um, did, I say, did, did I not show you that then? The seed, did I went past and came back? Okay, I'm really like out of control here. Um, okay, so the other reality is that the investor base is small in, in Pennsylvania. Um, but it's, it's equally, it's even smaller in New Jersey. These are investors that were active in 2017 across all sectors and across all stages. Now, if you're thinking about, oh, wait, I'm, an, I'm a life sciences company, I'm early stage, it's even smaller than these numbers. So that's the reality. But the real eye-opener is look what's going on in New York. There are 260 active investors, depending upon the stage and, and sector you're in, we need to make those our friends because they're only an hour away. They, they can jump on the train. They just have to have a reason to come here or you have to go to them. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So I think those are two facts um, that we have to be aware of. And in, in fact, when I was thinking about who are the early stage life sciences investors, it's pretty thin. Um, and, and we're not big. We don't, we don't have the resources to put 10 million or 20 million dollars into a company locally. So you see a lot of the companies, you know, Robinhood and Delaware Crossing, and they are active and they do have money, but they put in like 250,000. Uh, ben Franklin, I think, averages about 250,000 in investment. You know, we put in more, but it's still not quite enough. Um, Osage is a, is a big fund, but they, they can't lead around. Um, they wait for other people to lead, and that tends to take their money outside of the area. They don't invest too much here, although theoretically they could. Um, and Rittenhouse is more digital health. So, so it's a pretty, you know, I'm sure I'm, uh, I'm missing some people, people, but the point is they're not big funds, so we have to just live with this reality and do something to get around it. So I think the, the moral of the story is, and what I've realized I, I suspect what's going on, including companies in our own portfolio. People are scaling back their, their business to fit the amount of money that's available locally. Instead of just saying, okay, I need $3 million, I need $5 million, that's how I'm really going to be growing, that's how I'm going to get to the next value inflection point, that's how I'm going to really you know, supercharge my business. Instead, they're saying, well, I can get 500,000 or 750, and if all things go well, maybe a million dollars locally. And they're, they're, they're fitting their business to the local capital instead of just figuring out what the right number is. So we have taken it upon ourselves just because this has been a fairly recent realization because we've been kind of bothered by why aren't these seed companies moving forward? Um, so we're now challenging people that come in and say, I know they want a million, million five, but what could you do if you had another million? Or what, what would it look like? So we may have to, we're going to have to start syndicating with other investors, and I think we need to get them from New York. So that's kind of part of our plan. And we need to challenge entrepreneurs, say, don't, don't just come up with a number because that's what you think you can get. You've got to start going elsewhere. And... Um, I think, invest, I, I think entrepreneurs have to really decide, too, whether they're, they're going to go for the venture route or are they going to go for the uh, alternative capital. It's fine, like the Venatorixes of the world, to do alternative capital for a while, because at some point, if you get far enough along, venture will be interested. It's just that they may not be interested at the stage you are. So sometimes it's just a, it's a sequential financing plan. It's not forever doing NIH grants. So, you know, you have to think about what the permutations are and what makes sense for what you are. It takes a little bit of self-objectivity because not every company is investable. So, um, here, here are the basics, and I've talked about these at length in other talks in other years, and I'm happy to come back and if there's interest and people really want to get into the basics again, happy to do that in a workshop setting or if there, there are people who'd like to hear more, um, but you got to be able to solve a problem that somebody is willing to pay for. You have to have a business model that you, you, you're not raising so much money that investors can't make money at the end. You have to be raising the right amount of money and creating enough value so that investors can make money. Usually there's a time frame associated with that. We're an evergreen fund, so we're more patient. We can do seven, eight, nine years. 
and in some of our companies are still here 15 years from now and we haven't made any money, but that's okay because um, we're still you know, operating. But a lot of VCs do want to see three to five year time horizon. So that's the other reason. Sometimes you just need to get a little bit later with using alternative capital grants and things like that so that that time horizon is actually feasible by the time you go to a VC. Um, and then finally, the management team is important. You really need to have somebody at the table, even if it's not in the team per se, but somebody at the table, whether it's consultants, board members, that sort of thing, that know what they, that have done this before. You don't want to be making this up. It's really hard. And I do see that with the students. Some of the student entrepreneurs do make it up. And, you know, it's like, oh, God, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. But we do. We, we reinvent the wheel. Um, but it's better if you can have people at the table who actually have experience doing it. Now, so if you go to venture capital, there are a few more things you have to have in place. And this is superficial, but it's really true. you got to have a star. You need a star, whether it's a CEO who's made money for people or whether it's a Nobel Prize winner on your SAB. I mean, VCs just sort of go by proxy a little bit. You know, they want validation and they, they you know, they don't, they don't talk about it, but if you need to have something that, get, or you need to have a nature publication or something that's validation, that's external validation. And so if you don't have any of those, then you might, you, you know, you need to think more about the alternative capital so you can get to the stage where you can really have that profile. Um, Novel science, hot space, you know, cell therapy, mega deals are going on now in cell therapy. 50, 100, Team Unity, I think, is closing on 100 million. It's just a staggering amount of money, which, by the way, will help our numbers. So I think our numbers are going to go up. It's not a lot of deals, but there are a few big deals that are happening. They're in the works this spring. Um, I'm trying to think of another, like, synthetic lethality. I was talking to a, a GSK person last year. That's a hot topic. So. I'll show you a couple of examples of deals that are getting done in the venture space, and it really it has to be kind of cool science. And, uh, and along with that, strong IP. Man, this is a deal killer. If you don't have, com and we were just talking about this, uh, somebody at the table, um, if you're seven years into your patent life, forget it, because there is not enough patent life left at the end to be of interest to the big companies that are going to pay. So. You, when you go out to the market, when you actually file your IP and how soon you start the company it are all very tricky issues to deal with. Um, but strong IP is an absolute must. People, people are not interested in repurposed drugs, unfortunately, even though they make a lot of sense. They, you know, they used to like repurposed drugs when we got started. Repurposing was kind of, everybody liked risk, lower risk projects, but now you can't touch them. You can't get them into the venture market. So, um, and then the, the really perverse thing is big financings are easier to do than small financings. And that's because venture funds are getting really big. They have to deploy a lot more money. That's why they're putting more money in fewer companies. So we have a company now who's talking to some top tier VCs and he started off, he just wanted $15 million and that was kind of a nice size and that would get him pretty far with one asset. Um, and sure enough, he's now at 30 million because the VCs are all saying, well, what if we did this? What if we, let's do this? Because they're trying to find ways to justify putting more money in. So we'll see what the outcome is. But it's, it, if you're talking about tr traditional venture, bigger is better. Um, I don't like it. I think it's easier to make money if you keep the amount of money in less, but that's the way the world is. So I'm just telling you what I find. Um, these are, I just went to, I think these are November and December financings in the Series A space. Um, none of them are here, but it gives you an idea of how big the financings are and the kinds of things that are getting funded. Um, these are all top tier VCs. They're throwing lots of money. I think anything with a genetic tie and a genetic explanation, those are popular because it, it's a more rational way to approach a disease. Um, People like platforms now where there are multiple shots on goal so that you don't have a single asset that is binary and could fail and then blow up the whole thing. So, um, like I say, sexy science is in. And if you have something like that, uh, you'll do well in the venture market. Um, couple things to also think about. There's this hybrid, it's not quite alternative capital, and it's not quite traditional VC. I call it the strategic investors. I think this is a very important 
group of people to be aware of. Because strategic investors, you know, it seems like every big company, whether it's their pharma companies or medical devices, Boston, you know, BD, everybody's creating a venture fund. Keeping track of them is, is like the challenge. But um, they're really good because they are willing to go early. They're willing to take a risk because they're not in it just about money. They're in it because it also helps their parent company. So they are strategic, but they are willing to take more risks. Um, and in fact, their mandate is to sort of get ahead of the sign, you know, get some cutting edge signs in. So these people, if, if you can get one of these people uh, interested in what you're doing, that sort of validates the rest to the rest of the market and then the other investors follow because there's a lot of herd mentality that happens in the venture world. Um, so getting strategics, and I think the most interesting opportunity now are around healthcare systems. Healthcare systems are starting VCs all over the place. I, you know, I, you always heard about Kaiser and Mayo, and they've been around for a while. But uh, you know, Hackensack, Meridian, and Providence, and Inova, and uh, you know, Mount Sinai. So a lot of healthcare systems are getting into the space. I think it plays particularly well for digital health. But I, I also see them investing in things like diagnostics, which are so hard to get money for in the venture world. But diagnostics help a healthcare system. They, it really, the healthcare systems can save money if they get the right diagnostics in place, plus healthcare systems are the lowest cost developer. They have the clinical trial, they have access to the patients. So it's gonna be very interesting to see how these players uh, you know, play out over the years to come, but keep them in mind, it's a whole new crop of, um, a, new, a whole new source of capital. How am I doing on time? Fine, okay. All right, um, I, I talked about Alternative sources of capital, um, there's a lot. It's, the problem is it's super fragmented. It's all over the place. It's how do you find it. Between the NIH, every time I turn around, DOD, NIH, they're putting, they're putting up massive RFPs for big grants that take things through the clinic, for example. Um, one of our companies just applied for a couple big $7 million um, grant programs to work in the opioid space because opioids, it's a big issue, and you know, NIH is all over it. Um, and the infectious disease space is obviously another one, but there are some big opportunities that take you th well into um, patients. So make sure you are aware of those and keeping in touch with the NIH and looking around or working with somebody who is familiar with all the different resources there. Um, and then the Wellcome Trust. Donna tried to get the Wellcome Trust here. How many years ago was that? Oh my God, it would have been great. Um, but they do. Th yeah, it, was, it would have been great. And, and a bunch of our companies have gotten welcome trust money, and it seems to come here as opposed to other places, which is very interesting. And it's, again, six, seven million dollars. Um, so those are very meaningful. Family offices are a great source, but they're so hard to find, and I'll have a few tips on, on how to do that. Um, so just, you have to think creatively. You have to do a little bit of work. It's not gonna just drop in your lap. You gotta go find some of the stuff. And that's kind of one message. I think um, I noticed that companies, when I go to, I go to New York all the time to conferences. I go to Boston less frequently, but often. I never go to the West Coast. But I rarely see any companies from Philadelphia at any of these places. It's, and it's kind of mystifying. It's like, well, you know, why aren't they out and about? And I think people are, you know, they are, in this default mode, they just want to raise money locally, but that causes this whole vicious circle of no, you're gonna, you're gonna plateau if you do that. So you've got to get out and about. I think the best conferences I've seen for the maximum exposure to different kinds of capital, including some traditional capital, are the Resi conferences. They had one in New York last fall, I think. They have one in Boston. So Resi, it's just, if you Google R-E-S-I, I think you'll find um, the upcoming, they just finished Toronto, I think, this week. But I go to the New York and Boston ones, and it's a real eclectic group of people, not necessarily the Orba Meds of the world who put, want to put $20 million in, but it's these family offices and foundations and, and super angel groups, because so, that's their mission. Their mission is to try and herd all these alternative sources of capital into one place. I think they're quite good um, and, and would recommend them. And then there are other, you know, obviously there are disease specific conferences you can think about, but you've got to get out. You've, you've just got to get out and about. Um, 
And then the other source that I think I mentioned last year, there are tons of free newsletters, and it, it tells you who's raising money, who's investing money, who's, if you pay attention to just one or two of the ones on this list, I think you'll start to pick up the thread of who I should go approach, um, and, and I think it's a free way to do some market research. So, um, we're here to help too. We live and breathe. I'm, I'm in databases, you know, every month, trying to figure out who's investing in this, oh, what, what, what's going on. So, we're happy to help, guide you, we'll even give you some, some of our market research if you're really nice, um, and if we like what's going on. Um, we are happy to tell you where we think you are in the ecosystem and like what, whether we think you're going to be something that you could get to venture capital or whether we think you're better off following the alternative capital strategy. Um, and we'll tell you sort of at what point we would be willing to invest. Maybe it's now, maybe it's later. But we, we, we try and really help people who are trying to do this. This is hard, but it's fun. It's worth it, but you do need some support and we, that's what we try and provide. I think a couple things that we're doing now, just to um, uh, wrap up. Uh, wait, what am I supposed to? I, I can't believe I'm this incompetent. Never mind. Okay, so a couple things we're doing. Um, <coughs> we are starting an EIR program, um, and that's an entrepreneur in residence program. It's people who've come out of other out of companies and are looking for the next opportunity. We're using them for outreach because we are a small team. We only have three investment professionals and trying to deploy capital at the pace that we want, we really need some help, but we, you know, we don't want to spend a ton of money on overhead either. So we're using EIRs that um, can reach out and especially to academic institutions. Um, we're also gonna, probably you're gonna hear more about this, I hope. There's this newsletter called Big Three Bio, which I put up on the, um, on the screen, which is free. It happens in San Francisco, and I think it's one in San Diego as well. We've approached them to see if they would do something, obviously not called Big Three Bio, but called something else for Philadelphia. It's a, it's a news aggregator, because I think one of the issues in this region is half the time the people in Doylestown, and it is a robust biotech scene out in Doylestown, don't know what's going on down here, and the people out in Exton don't really. So we're just a huge reason, and I think we need to almost raise awareness of the bigger community that we're in. And so if we're gonna explore whether that's something that we can get here, because uh, I think it would really help for everybody, and you'd feel like you're part of a bigger community, and I, because we are. It's just that some people are more, you know, sometimes you just get stuck in your silo and you don't realize what else is going on. And I think if we could raise the awareness, that would be good for us and it would be good for the outside world to see how much is going on here. And then um, I think the, the big takeaway, I think, from this is that we are trying to syndicate with investors from outside the region, and that's gonna be a really important part of our business going forward. We're making, you know, we're making a big effort to try and do that. So, um, so come and talk to us. We have money to invest, and we're happy to help. So. So we'll, we'll do a few questions, and I'm going to take the privilege of the microphone since I, oh, sure. one of the things that you brought up, Barbara, was something that was uh, is something that we've talked about internally. So um, when you mention health systems that are moving toward venture capital, what's what's the order of magnitude, and what's driving that? I'll stand here. Um, some are pretty big, like 50 million, but it's 50 million a year. Some are just investing off the balance sheet over that amount, maybe over three years. Some, I mean, so it is all over the board, um, but it's meaningful, and, and I think they're trying to put a couple million dollars into a company, not just a couple hundred thousand. So, but I can get you a little bit more information on that. Yeah, that, that would be great. Well, yeah. Which of the health systems was the biggest surprise when you looked at it? I thought um, Innova. I, I guess I don't think of them. They're not associated with a medical school. You know, it's like, wow, Northern Virginia, okay. And, you know, have at it. So, next, anybody else? Here. Uh, two points about you mentioned the funding, the investment going down. One potential source could be the uh, uh, 
mutual, uh, I mean, not the mutual, the fund, the larger funds, where there was a steep decline, at least some part of the money is still staying in their bank accounts. Could you ask them to temporarily <laughs> make up the gap in the angel arena? And the other one is Boston, despite the number of investors being low, lower than New York, quite a bit, had a much higher total. So can we learn from them what they are doing to get more money per investment from the investors that even New York is not able to? Yes, I think the, the truth of the matter is venture capital goes to where it thinks it's gonna thrive. And, if it, if, and companies in Boston have made money for investors. So there is a belief that investing in Boston companies is how you're gonna make money. So when you're in a, a region that doesn't have as much capital, you have to be competitive. You have to show that there's a way to make money. And I think if we can have a couple companies, more companies like a Spark, obviously people are looking here. And in fact, in the cell therapy and gene therapy space, investors are coming here because they now see that there is something special. There are, people are making money. And so they are starting to come here. Not, they're not housed here, but they're, the money is flowing here. And it's about you go where you think you can make money. And we have to convince ourselves, and there have to be enough role models to show that, we, that you can make money. And Boston has already had that. All right, I took the microphone from Donna. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. You're always such a wealth of information. Um, <laughs> it's great to have you again. Uh, was curious if you could let us know last year what your average investment was, the number that you did, and if you want to like break down the sectors, I'd be super interested to hear. Okay. And then what you're shooting for this year. Um, yeah, that, I, two, no, that's my two first questions. Okay, I think we invested 3.8 or 3.9 last year. We are probably going to be at six and a half or seven this year. Um, it's except this year is a little bit more eclectic. I think last year it was digital health and therapeutics, and those tend to be our our, our core investments. Um, for the reasons I <coughs> excuse me, for the reasons I showed you, devices are really hard to finance going forward, so we, we haven't seen any that we are comfortable have a path forward, except for the little uh, Talix Medical, which was, frankly, it's not even an FDA-approved product. It just can go on the market, and there was a ton of patient experience. So that was an exception, um, but most, most, of our, most of our investments are in the digital health and therapeutic space, because we've made most of our money in the therapeutics. So money goes to where it's been successful before. I'm, uh, I'm curious about the, uh, the biomechanical, the, uh, the, the biotech sphere in, in the sense of devices. Is this because <coughs> of the regulation, the hurdles that they have to jump to get uh, approval, or is there something else going on here that would... Uh... It's all relative. Again, in the medical device space, people can take $50 million and maybe they can make $200 million, get valued at $200 million on exit. So investors can make some money, but not a lot. You take that same 50 million, you put it in a cell therapy company that is worth $2 billion in the same amount of time, and the money goes to that. So it's, and I don't see the med device sector recovering because there's just so much value being created in biotech and pharma, and there's just comparatively not in, in, the, in the device world because they're never gonna be worth $2 billion. So it's, it's a real discrepancy. It's just a market dysfunction. I think some people still believe in that space and want to do it and are happy with three to four X, but other VCs are saying, oh, I want 10 X. I'm putting my money in cell therapy, even though it's riskier. So it's a conundrum. I, I don't have a good answer for you about whether it's going to change. You will also hear some people complaining about the tax policy and there is a medical device tax. I don't really think that's what's going on. It, it doesn't help, but it's, it's not the, the core reason why the, the, there's a decline. Barbara, a wonderful perspective, as always. Um, so you mentioned cell and gene therapy, and I'm just wondering if you could comment on some of the opportunities um, peripheral to that, like in genomics and analytics and even manufacturing, things like that. I think there is activity in the manufacturing space, interestingly, because we've got, a, you know, the cost of autologous cell therapies is pretty astronomical. So I think I have seen some recent investments, not by us, but, and I haven't seen local technology, but I do think there are some opportunities there. Um, uh, analytics, 
Okay, this is not my field. I, I am not into AI. I can't even figure out what AI, how, how to deal with that. There is a lot of money, though, going into AI. Again, not here necessarily, but I think there's a lot of money in New York, and it wouldn't be that hard to bring it down if you have something. So I do, I do think that's, it's actually considered non-healthcare, I think, that's, it's, it's in the bigger numbers, yeah. Unless anyone else has another question, I'm gonna ask one final question. I'm, this is, we, we barely ever get to talk, so. Um, <laughs> I'm just curious, uh, in, on the therapeutics uh, side, are you seeing anything in terms of new antibiotic development? I mean, we keep reading horror stories. Venatorix, yeah, and um, the government is throwing tons of money at that. That's why Venatorx got $100 million, because they're doing resistant you know, pathogens. Um, and we like that space. We've made money in that space before. So I haven't seen any recent um, infectious disease approaches in coming over the transom to us. Um, but Venatorx, I think, is going to be very successful. I'm hoping they go public someday, because they have seven programs, tons of money, now good VCs. I'm hoping they go public, because we need some more public companies some high growth companies. Thank you, Barbara. Sure. Always great to have you at Jefferson.